Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how I made this science fiction environment concept with the help of my own Biogen add-on, which is freely available for Blender 2.8. Alongside this video, I'm releasing version 4 of the add-on, which is mostly comprised of behind the scenes structural changes, but it also adds a few extra features to play with, one of which is a new tool called the Cubic Field Generator, which we'll be using to make the concept today. If you go to the Shift A menu, then to Biogen, you'll see that there are two categories called Templates and Generators. This is new to version 4. In Templates, you will find the starting objects that can be found in the previous versions of the add-on for letting you create hard surface or organic structures along with some extra effects. But before we get into making things, I just need to make a quick note about how generators work in Biogen. The contents of the add-on are currently split between the Shift A menu and the panels on the end menu. Generators on the Shift A menu are what I call non-input generators, meaning they do not require an input mesh to function, so they create something from nothing. Whereas any generators accessible through the generation panel are what I call input-based generators, meaning they require an input mesh to be selected prior to performing the operation. But what we're going to be using in this video is a new addition to the add-on called the Cubic Field, which is a non-input generator accessible from the Shift A menu. If you click on it, you will notice that a simple cloud of cubes has appeared in the scene, which by itself is nothing impressive, but I'm going to show you how to turn it into an interesting science fiction concept. On the left, you will see all of the parameters for this generator. There's a random seed, which you can use to shuffle the random values of the procedure. Then of course you have control over the number of cubes. Try not to set it too high, because that will start slowing everything down. Below that you have the minimum and maximum position deviations, which you can use to change how distributed you want the cubes to be over space. The values represent the X, Y, and Z positions respectively. As you change them, you can see the changes in real time. Below the position deviation, you have the scale deviation. And if I go and turn off the uniform scale setting below, then you can see how the cubes now take on different shapes. If you change the scale deviation values now, you can see the effect this has. When uniform scale is turned on, it just takes the X value and uses that for the other axes as well. I'll put uniform scale back on now, and what you can see as I change the kick rotation value is that it toggles rotational changes on the cubes. So if you wanted to keep them all in line, then you just keep that disabled. Following that, there's an option to join cubes into one mesh after the procedure is complete, which is enabled by default. There's also an add bevel toggle, which adds a bevel modifier once the procedure is complete. This bevel option will only be available if join cubes is enabled. So how do we go from this basic set of floating cubes to a science fiction environment concept? Well, I'll walk you through my process now. We'll start off by increasing the number of cubes to around 100. If your computer has trouble with this, then feel free to turn the numbers down a bit. I'll make the maximum position deviation something like 10, 50, and 17, so we start to get a kind of scattered outstretched line. I'm going to have the uniform scale tick box checked, although it's not essential for this technique. You could just as well use random scales, so feel free to experiment. Since I'm using uniform scale, I'm going to set the first values to 0.5 and 1.5. All the uniform tick box does is use the X value for the Y and Z, so you only need to worry about changing the first values. Once we've got this scattered line, we can start looking for somewhere inside the crevices of the cubic field that would look interesting for a composition. Personally, I like to use the walk camera mode to move around it like a first person controller. You can get to this by searching for walk. I have my search function set to spacebar, but you should also be able to get to this by pressing F3 on Blender 2.8. I've bound the walk slash fly command to shift F like I had it in Blender 2.7. I really like having it on that hotkey because I use it a lot when making things. Anyway, you can use this walk mode to navigate yourself into a position that you think would be good for a composition. If you don't like the layout of the cubes, you can go back and change the random seed. Once we found a spot, we can start thinking about putting a camera at our location. To demonstrate, I quite like the layout of this place I found. So while my viewport is sitting here, I'm going to press Shift A, then make a camera. This will place a new camera at the 3D cursor somewhere in the scene. But we want the newly created camera to take the position and rotation of our current viewport. The way we do that is by pressing Ctrl, Alt, and Numpad 0. You will see that we've now entered the camera and it's taken up our original position and rotation. It might also feel a bit more zoomed in than before, but that's just because of the focal length of the camera. If you click on the camera tab in the properties window with the camera selected, you can adjust the focal length to something that you like. Another cool thing about the walk slash fly mode is that while we're inside of the camera, we can use it to move the camera in real time. So if I activate the mode again, you can see that I can move the camera in first person. Anyway, now that we've got the setup for our composition, we're going to start working on the rendering and atmospherics. I'm going to bring up the shader node editor and make sure we're in the world mode. We'll be setting up the volumetric lighting in these nodes, but before that, I'm going to put the viewport into rendered mode. I'm using the EV rendering engine for this. As you can see, everything is black because we don't have any light sources here, so I'm going to quickly make a point light and put it where we can see its effect. You're free to use any kind of lighting you like. Once we've got a bit of light in the scene, I'll go to the nodes and add a principled volume shader. 
then I'll set the density to something like 0.03. You can see the light in the scene is now reacting with the volume. Feel free to move it around and maybe even add some more. Remember, areas of darkness are just as important as areas of light, so try not to light everything in the scene. It's nice to get some strong silhouettes. A nice little trick for lighting abstract environments like this is to put strong sources of light in places that are just out of sight behind objects to give the implication that there is something important there and that the scene has a purpose. Now is also a nice time to play with the mood of the lighting. If you have more than one light, you can experiment with blending colours together. For example, a light blue with a yellowy orange that is placed a bit further back. Again, a change in colour hidden away helps with the implication that there is something of importance tucked away out of sight. Now before we start chopping up blocks and adding details, we can make the light react with the cubes in a slightly more interesting way by adding a bevel modifier and increasing the segment count. If you zoom in on the edges of the cubes, you can see the harsh faces there, so to get rid of that we can just right click and then choose Shade Smooth. Feel free to change the bevel width to anything you like. Now to assist with a sense of scale and imply a story, I'm going to paste in one of my base character models. This blend file is available from the link in the description. Feel free to take the character and use it in your own scenes. I'm going to select the light source above and to the left and turn on contact shadows and then slightly increase the distance just so that we get the appropriate shadows for this character silhouette. Now if we go and take a look at one of the test scenes I made while playing around with this technique, you can see that I had quite a lot of fun chopping up some of the cubes and adding random bits of geometry to make the scene more interesting. So that's what we're going to do next. To carve shapes out of the cubes, I'm actually going to be using Box Cutter, which is a paid add-on, but don't worry, it's certainly not required to cut shapes out of objects. The reason I'm using Box Cutter is because I can easily do the cutting without leaving the camera view. For example, if I choose the Box Cutter tool, then with the cube shape selected, I can hold Ctrl to drag a shape over the surface and then cut it out, all without changing the view. You can see how this makes it really, really easy to start chopping up the scene. There's also a massive collection of settings to choose exactly how you want the cutting to work. But there's all sorts of other ways to do this for free with just Blender. You can use the Boolean modifier to cut one shape out of another, or you can use the knife tool in edit mode with the K hotkey to draw shapes on the mesh and extrude it. There's also a free add-on called Fast Carve, which is also for cutting out shapes, and the paid Fluent add-on also has its own version of a cutter as well. So I would say experiment, find a method that you feel comfortable with using, and start creating some interesting shapes. I'm going to move ahead to a version of the scene that I prepared earlier. One note I would make about any characters or other points of focus in the scene is to make sure the background behind them is not too complex, because it will make their shape more difficult to identify. Another tip is that you can focus the details of the surfaces of the cubes towards the sources of light to make the results more interesting to look at. Notice that where the light sources hit the cubes, I've tried to make the most interesting progressions of detail. The areas of highest contrast are most likely going to be the first thing the viewer looks at, so take that into consideration. This cutting process is also an interesting opportunity to experiment with the distribution of large to medium to small shapes. I recommend watching this talk by Gleb Alexandrov at the Blender conference because he explains it very well, although I do find myself breaking that rule quite often and getting carried away. You might also notice that the scene is a bit darker now, and that's because I gave the cube object a basic PBR material that has a darker base colour and is slightly more metallic. Making it more metallic helps to isolate the light on the surfaces of the objects in a non-realistic context. For example, notice how the light now blends from a mild blue to the background colour at the end of the object. It's actually quite hard to tell exactly where the object ends, which is exactly how I want it to be. However, you typically wouldn't use the metallic value this way in more realistic renders. The darker, closer cube has been moved slightly to the right to balance out the scene. This is also being considerate of the rule of thirds. Speaking of which, you can actually enable composition guides on any selected camera. You can go to the camera settings in the properties window, then to viewport display, and then to a section called composition guides. If you turn on the thirds option, you can see that the character and the brightest coloured detail areas are in line with the grid, but again it's just a guide and it's certainly not essential for your artwork. Now when you've reached a point like this, you're in a really good position to take it to the finish line. Add some textured and organic elements, tell a story in it, etc. Just have fun with it and see where it takes you. I like doing projects like this because it goes to show how you don't need hyper complex super sub D sci-fi kitbash libraries to make something that looks interesting. Making a complex scene out of simple elements like cubes is a very good test to practice concepting and design skills, and the simplicity of this helps to make it more enjoyable and less frustrating. After a bit more experimenting with the scene, I've ended up with this, which is the final blend file that you will find in the resources. So feel free to download the demonstration blend files and the Bygen add-on for free from the links in the description. Experiment and try to build your own interesting scenes and make sure to tag me in your work. I'm looking forward to seeing how you can take this idea and push it further. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and ring the notification bell. 
To stay up to date on content, you can follow me on social media or join our Discord server. So thanks for watching, have a nice day, and I'll see you next time.